right? Okay. I've never presented without looking at the screen, so I'll, um, I'll try and do that. Yeah, and there's one in front of me, right? Yeah. But it's and just like, yeah. kind of Okay, all right, let's try. Um, so, uh, hello everyone, and thanks for staying for this uh, last tutorial. So, my name is Phoebe Vajana, so I'm an assistant professor of industrial and systems engineering here at USC. And um, what I want to uh, do today is give you a brief uh, introductory tutorial on robust optimization and sequential decision making. So, really, what I want to do is that is I want to give you like the two like most basic things you need to know about robust optimization and kind of convince you that you should be using robust optimization. These are my two objectives. If I manage to convey this to you, I'd be very happy today. So, so let's get started. So um, what's uh, robust optimization and um, adaptive uh, or adjustable robust optimization all about? Well, it's about uh, helping you make uh, uh, good or optimal uh, real-world decisions, okay? So in the context of um, this workshop, maybe some problems that uh, come to mind and that are maybe related to um, what Bistra was talking about today. Um, for example, well, say uh, I'm trying to decide uh, which areas uh, I should be protect protecting uh, using a limited budget, right? And uh, in a way that I can protect maybe as many species as possible or at least so many animals of a given species as possible. Um, a challenge, um, right, another, another problem would be um, related to uh, what one of the students was talking about yesterday, I can't see her, uh, Liz. Um, she had this problem in the context of conservation planning again, where um, she had drones at her disposal that were uh, recording uh, images of, um, uh, of parks, right, and uh, she was able to use like AI to identify, to automatically detect, I should say, poachers and, uh, and animals, right, from her images. So a natural question, again, in this context, coming from an optimization side is, well, uh, how should I be flying my drones, actually, to collect the most useful information, right? Because she has those images at her disposal, but presumably they were collected in some way, right? Should I be guiding my drones in some uh, precise fashion in order to gather as much useful information as possible to ultimately catch the poachers, right? Um, an alternative question would be, so uh, on her project, I think they had both drones and trucks. Well, how can I coordinate the two to work together, right? To maybe uh, use each of them for what they're good at. Maybe the truck can uh, travel faster on routes, but then cannot access like uh, heavy forested uh, areas, right? Another question, um, uh, hopefully also of interest to people in this consortium, uh, relates to security, right? So. Um, uh, when we go to the airport, uh, oftentimes we need to uh, go through a checkpoint right before we um, uh, gain access to a secure area. And um, uh, in order to gain access to that secure area, we must be screened, right? Um, the reason why the screening takes place is hopefully to help um, uh, detect uh, any uh, malicious uh, passenger, right, that would want to uh, conduct an attack on one of the airplanes. So in this context, what happens is that the TSA has some limited resources, right? Um, for example, a limited amount of x-rays, um, some like full body scanners, etc. and they must decide who to scan with what methodology, right? Knowing that the um, more um, intense the scan, the longer it's going to take, uh, and at the same time, uh, the more likely you are to catch the attacker, right? The more methods you use to, to screen him. Uh, so, um, you're faced basically with a trade-off between like efficacy, um, between efficiency and effectiveness, right? Like, wh who should you screen how somehow? Can we devise a personalized screening strategy, right? Um, right. So what I want to argue in one slide is that optimization is the right way to address this problem. So that, that's out of the way. And then I'm going to address the robust component um, of this talk, right? So why is optimization the right way in my view? Well, so um, in short, it enables us to uh, model very complicated real-world decision-making problems, right, uh, in a compact fashion, and it oftentimes enables us to solve those problems and get optimal or near-optimal decisions quite fast, right? So what we do in optimization is we um, model uh, our decisions uh, using decision variables, which I'm calling here uh, uh, using this vector x, um, we model our objective using this function f. This basically tells us 
Um, it gives us a way to measure which decision we should prefer over another one, right? So we're trying to find a decision that would have achieved the smallest value um, of this uh, function f. And um, we have oftentimes in the real world some constraints um, that uh, we encode here using this set calligraphic um, X that says that not all decisions are feasible. For example, we may have budget constraints, et cetera, that um, I'm expressing compactly in this fashion, right? And so oftentimes both um, our objective and our constraints, they are parametrized by um, uh, Xi, which are some problem parameters of the problem, right? So what happens is that if I know Xi, right, my problem is well defined, right? If, if the, problem, the parameters of the problem, for example, in the context of the security problem I was talking about before, if I know precisely when my passengers arrive, if I know precisely um, how they're going to behave, if I know precisely the effectiveness of my screening resources, then maybe this problem is well defined. A problem, though, um, comes up in the real world, the problem that usually comes up in the real world is that um, we have a lot of uncertainty of all of, about all of these things, right? For example, in conservation planning, I have no idea where my animals like, are going to go, right? So maybe I expect that they're going to be in a certain cell, but actually they're going to be somewhere completely different. And add to that, the future may not be like the past, right? So climate uh, change, etc., may affect how animals are going to move. And so in practice, at the moment when I make my decision, I don't really know how, what the future is going to look like in some sense, right? So uh, mathematically speaking, these parameters xi, they're actually uncertain, right? So at this point, then the good question would be, well, okay, let's just take these parameters and make them equal in my optimization problem to their expected values, right? So maybe I have some historical data, for example, for passenger arrivals, I take that data, I average um, across like years and find the um, uh, expected number of animals in each cell or the expected number of passengers that arrive in any given quarter and so on and so forth, right? I could do that. Then my problem becomes clearly again well defined. I fix Xi to some expected value and I solve my problem. Why is this not a good idea? So let's think about this young man who um, actually is just coming back from the pub, right? He's trying to get home. <laughs> and, um, and so he's decided to um, use this very busy highway to get home. Um, but unfortunately, he's not walking very straight, right? I said he's very drunk. And so let's think about the average position of this young man. Yeah, you will agree with me that the average position of this man is along the middle of this busy highway. Yeah, so if I think about the state of the drunk at his average position, right, I'm going to think he's safe and sound, yeah, that he will get home. On the other hand, yeah, if I think about the expected state of this young man, well, more often than not, he's not on this line, right? And so it is quite likely actually that he won't be getting home. Right? So this tells us that if we ignore uncertainty and just um, treat the uncertain parameters as being equal uh, to their nominal values, um, we may end up coming up with plans, for example, uh, paths for this man that um, uh, will be infeasible, right? meaning he will not get home. Okay, so I think I motivated that optimization is a good tool for addressing real-world decision-making problems, and um, that I motivated that we cannot ignore uncertainty in optimization. All right? So now um, I'd like to start briefly easing you into the robust part. So um, at the high level, what are we usually given? So usually we're given a description of a decision-making problem in words, and hopefully, if we're lucky, uh, like Bistra, some data. And then, using this, um, these two things, we try to come up with a model that we think is representative of the problem we're trying to address, right? I'm going to keep it at that for the time being. And then from the model, we hope that 
so maybe a mathematical optimization model, I should say, or mathematical model of some sort, um, we come up with uh, what are at least feasible decisions uh, relating to my young uh, drunk man, and uh, hopefully also optimal or at least near optimal decisions, right? So this is what we're trying to do. This is usually the problem we, we are faced with. So I said that in terms of my model, I'm happy that I'm going to use optimization, right? But I'm still like left with the question, well, what am I going to do with my data, right? How am I going to encode this uncertainty in my optimization model, right? We said let's not use expectations, not a good idea. So the argument is that in practice, what we have at our disposal is the data, right? And traditionally, what we have been doing in optimization is that we've been using probability distributions in order to model uncertainty in our data. So we took our data, we fitted the distribution, and then we had that distribution for use in our optimization problem, okay? But really, probability distributions, they don't really exist, right? We, the only thing that we were given is data, and we chose to use that data and to obtain a probabilistic model of, of uncertainty to fit into our optimization problem. So really, Probability distributions, they are a modeling choice that we consciously make, right? And now I'm going to quote my postdoc advisor and like a co-author of mine um, that make the following very nice argument, I think. They basically state that, okay, when we developed modern probability theory, right, our intentions were not really to use them in optimization, right? So it, the intention was not to have a model that enabled us to solve our optimization problems fast, right? And on the contrary, Danzig, when he developed the theory like uh, OR, let's say, he, was, he had like tractability in mind, right? He wanted a model that he can, and an algorithm that he can solve efficiently, right? And for which he can obtain optimal solutions fast. So why are we really trying to marry these two things is a question, right? Is this a good idea? Well, so for years and years, that's what we've been trying to do in optimization, right? And unfortunately, it turns out that more often than not, in particular, when you have a lot of uncertain parameters that are highly correlated, etc., cetera, um, you, what you obtain when you feed these distributions into your optimization problems is a model that you cannot solve in a reasonable amount of time, at least not in a time that maybe um, um, fast enough for your application of interest, right? On the contrary, what we know how to solve very fast is linear optimization problems, convex optimization problems, and to echo Bistra discrete optimization problems, right? So in practice, we can solve them fast. I know this is a controversial statement maybe to make in CS, but I think Bistra like, uh, made the argument for me uh, earlier. So, so really, the summary here is that Modeling with distributions was a choice, right? It's not that we were necessarily given a distribution, right? Oftentimes we had to build, in fact, the distribution from the data. And so the question here is like, is it the right choice? Yeah, probably since it results in problems that we cannot solve fast, probably it's not the right choice, right? <coughs> All right. Now, I think like, something that inspires robust optimization is um, this statement. It says that when we have uh, large-scale random phenomena, right, um, then uh, together they collect, uh, they, um, uh, sorry, um, right, they result, they create non-random regularity, right? And this is precisely the view of robust optimization. In robust optimization, what we do is instead of like, we, we take a kind of deterministic view of uncertainty, okay? We are not really per se going to model uncertain parameters as random parameters, okay? So we're going to move away from probability distributions, okay? And basically, instead of actually using probability distributions in our optimization problems, what we're going to do is we're going to just use probability to guide us, probability theory to guide us in building our model of uncertainty. But then we're trying to stay away from using these distributions explicitly in our, in our model. So what do we do? Well, the idea is to forget about probability distributions and work with something called an uncertainty set, okay? 
So what do we do here? In my figure, we, um, I'm introducing this uncertainty set that I denote by Xi, right? This can be viewed as the set of all uncertain parameters that I would like to be immunized against. So I want that for any realization of the uncertain parameters in this set, my constraints should be satisfied. Okay, so if we think about our drunk, maybe we want that, well, no matter how much he deviates on each side, he should remain alive, okay? So going back to our nominal optimization problem, right, where we wanted to minimize this function f subject to x lying in a feasible set that is parameterized by xi, and xi now being uncertain, I'm just going to say, well, I want that no matter which um, a realization of xi I observe coming from this uncertainty set, my x should be feasible. So um, let's think about this. So I'm picking a point xi1 from uh, my uncertainty set xi. For that, I obtain a corresponding feasible region for x, right? I denote that by calligraphic x of xi1, this is my purple region. I do the same for xi2, this gives me the red region. Xi3, the blue region, right? And basically I want that no matter which Xi in Xi I see, I be feasible, so I need to take the intersection of all these colored regions, right? And that will give me my feasible set. So clearly then, with these uh, new constraints in my robust problem, no matter which Xi materializes, my X will be actually implementable, okay? And so, and clearly if you imagine as I grow the set Xi, right, the more robust I am because the, even if uh, the uncertain parameters deviate a lot from their nominal values, I will remain, I will be feasible, right? But clearly I'm reducing my feasible space, so I'm going to um, be able to optimize less well in some sense, right? Uh, and then conversely, the smaller uh, the set xi, the less robust I am, right? One could think about converging to a point in which case I recover my uh, problem with a nominal uh, xi value. Is the uh, formulation clear? All right, I'm going to take this as a yes. So, so what have we done? So going back to um, my uh, three-step process I had earlier, effectively what I propose to do is to uh, replace our model in the middle with optimization plus uncertainty sets rather than optimization plus probability theory. And ultimately what are, we are going to obtain is hopefully optimal actually decisions that we can compute very efficiently um, and at the same time that are guaranteed to be implementable and feasible. All right. <clears throat> and so what we're going to do is we're going to bound the power of nature by suitably constructing these uncertainty sets. All right. Uh, and we're going to use probability theory and maybe like the conclusions of probability theory to guide how we uh, are going to construct those uncertainty sets. But this is the key, it should be in red. Uh, what we're going to do mostly is that as we build these uncertainty sets, right, and as we make these modeling choices, crucially tractability is going to be in the back of my mind, of our mind, right? So we want to develop a model that will enable us, that will give us an optimization problem in the end that we can actually solve, right? So I can devise like the most sophisticated uncertainty set, blah, 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 that is the best fit or I don't know what, and then I cannot solve the problem, which is kind of what happens with probability theory, yeah? And so, so uh, the argument here is that we need to devise models of uncertainty that are adequate for what we're trying to do, which is optimize, okay? And so, so that's why I keep tractability in mind. All right, so, uh, so now I'd like to start discussing how we're going to construct uncertainty sets. I'm going to start from the most basic thing one could do, which is actually the first thing that was ever uh, discussed as an uncertainty set that was back in the 1970s. And people hated it, very rightly, you're going to understand why. And actually I think that it's much of the reason why people think when they hear robust optimization that robust optimization is conservative. So I want to discuss it to get it out of the way and then I want you to forget about it, okay? So, um, so let's um, go back to the uh, example of uh, Bistro and conservation planning, okay? So we're trying to decide which cells um, we're going to protect Okay, and um, in each cell, there is an amount xi i um, of a given species. Okay, and this xi i is uncertain, 
Okay, so in cell i, there's an amount xi i. I don't know, though, um, what that amount is. Historically, I've looked at my data, and I know that on average, I have mu i animals in, say, in cell i, and that the standard deviation of the number of animals is sigma i. Okay, so I can normalize uh, my random parameters in some sense and say that, well, um, uh, the quantity, the normalized quantity xi i minus mu i over sigma i will be bounded between uh, plus and minus gamma. Yeah, sounds reasonable, right? It says, okay, I, don't, I know it's going to be roughly equal to uh, what it was in the past, right? But I don't exactly know. I want, I want to be um, covered if I have some more animals, fewer animals. Sounds reasonable? All right, so let's do that. So um, this is just the formulation of Vistra earlier, um, or, um, yeah. Uh, so here xi would be my decision to protect cell i or not, right? Um, xi i s would be uh, the number of uh, animals uh, of species s in cell i, right? And p s would be my targets for species s. Okay, and then maybe the set calligraphic x can represent the complicated like connectivity constraints or stuff like that. Okay, and so I want ci would be the cost of protecting cell i. I want to find um, the um, choices of x that are going to um, give me the minimum uh, uh, cost of protection in some sense. All right, and so we have our box uncertainty set, which says that for all species and for all cells. Uh, the amount of animals would be um, uh, close to their nominal values. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? So I want to ensure that at least an amount PS of each species S is protected. Okay. Independently of how many animals are in each cell, and the number of animals in each cell are restricted to lie in this box uncertainty set. What is the worst case that can happen here? Any ideas? Yeah? There are a lot of corners. There are a lot of corners, yeah. Which one's the worst corner? You have many fewer in the place in which you select. Okay, yeah. I mean, independently of what I select, right? Always the worst in terms of my plan is going to be that in each cell there are how many animals of each species? As few as possible, yeah, the lower bound, yeah? So with this very naive uncertainty set that in principle looks reasonable, yeah? I'm saying that I want to be protected for a case where in each and every cell and for each and every species, there are in each cell as few animals as possible. Okay? This is overly conservative, right? It's very unlikely that this will happen, right? So what can we do? Can we pick something better? So there are some things that we may know in general, right? This is a very cool thing with uncertainty sets is that we can use any information that we have about our uncertain parameters and just add constraints in the uncertainty set, right? For example, maybe I want to say that I know the total number of animals that there are across all the area I'm trying to protect. Yeah? To top this eliminates many of those corners, right? Anything else? All right, so here's an idea. I'm not going to go through all the possible uh, uncertainty sets that have been discussed out there. Um, uh, I'm just going to propose one alternative, right? And then let you go explore, okay? So, um, so here, um, let's, um, what I want to do first is uh, give you a bit of a reminder about the central limit theorem. So what does this say? It says that if um, the xi i's are iid, are random variables that are iid with a certain mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, 
then uh, we know that um, their normalized sum uh, is a normal with mean zero and standard deviation one, right? So basically, sums of random variables tend to be close to their mean, assuming there's enough of them, right? So can we use this result to improve our uncertainty set? So remember I've said, right, that uh, stocha that uh, uh, stochastic optimization is in particular intractable when we're moving to high dimensions, right? When we have many uncertain parameters, right? And so really what we're looking for here is for a good model for when probability theory would fail us, right? Which is precisely this high dimensional setting. So in a problem in which I have many uncertain parameters, can I use the central limit theorem in order to build new uncertainty sets? How about just adding my random variables together, right? My now random, they're no longer random here, right? I'm going to say that my new uncertainty set is going to be the set of all parameters xi, such that when I normalize them and add them all together, they lie between plus and minus gamma square root n, where n is the number of uncertain parameters. This is probably not going to be a very good model if n is low, right? But if n becomes large, this is actually going to be quite good, right? And in fact, I can choose the gamma in order to uh, tune how confident I want to be in my results, right? For example, if I choose gamma equals 2, since I know that what I have is a normal with, standard deviation, with uh, mean 0 and standard deviation 1, then I know that the probability that the uncertain parameters lie in the uncertainty set that I constructed is around 0 0.95, right? If I increase gamma, I want to be more robust, remember? And then the probability that my uncertain parameters materialize in this set becomes 99.7, right, percent. Have I lost everybody? Is someone still with me? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so, um, so we can model correlation information using factor models. I don't really want to go about, uh, talk about this. It's not very interesting. So just to point out, we actually used um, uh, this approach in the context of estimating patient wait times in the US kidney allocation uh, system. Here, basically, you have patients that are waiting for kidneys. And in order to estimate how long they're going to have to wait, you need to understand uh, how uh, kidneys arrive. Um, and in order to model uh, the distribution of kidney arrivals without using probability theory, we use a variant of this uncertainty set that uh, is based on the generalized central limit theorem. Um, and, um, and basically, by changing the value of gamma, we are able to estimate different quantiles of the wait time distribution. And this is what I'm showing here. I'm showing for um, a specific uh, pay for um, for a specific donation area that's in Pennsylvania. Um, how uh, the wait times are going to vary in dependence of the patient rank, and each line corresponds to a different value of gamma, which corresponds to a different quantile of the wait time distribution. So, for example, someone ranked 60 would have to wait around a thousand days uh, before they get an offer for a kidney. All right. All right, so hopefully um, by now I've at least motivated that optimization is good, uh, that robust seems to make sense from a modeling perspective, um, and that it's very flexible, that maybe it enables us to uh, incorporate information about our uncertain parameters that we may not be able to incorporate using classic, at least easily, using uh, probability theory. And now I want to show you that actually it results in computationally tractable models. All right, so um, all right. So let's consider this uh, linear optimization problem. Okay, so we all remember from our very first optimization class, uh, a, uh, an optimization pro a linear optimization problem reads: minimize C transpose x. X are here my decision variables, which I have uh, put in blue. The data will be in black always, and the uncertainty will be in red. Subject to a x less than b. And now what happens, remember, I have uncertainty in my model. So the matrix A is no longer perfectly known. The right-hand side vector B is no longer perfectly known. They are both affected by some uncertain parameters, uh, xi, that live in an uncertainty set, xi. 
OK, capital Xi. And um, uh, for this talk, I'm going to assume that both the matrix A and the right-hand side vector B are actually affine in the uncertain parameters. Okay, so uh, they can be written uh, in short as, um, so A of Xi, each of its rows is an affine function of the vector Xi, uh, and so it's expressible in this fashion for some perfectly known matrix A and perfectly known vector um, A, AI. Uh, and similarly, B of Xi is affine, so it can be expressed in this fashion for some known matrix B and vector B. Okay, it's clear? All right. And now we're going to work with a polyhedral uncertainty set. Okay, this is exactly what we've been, uh, both sets that I discussed earlier are polyhedral. Okay, so effectively, uh, our uncertainty set can be written in um, the form um, uh, of the set of all xi that satisfy this collection of um, uh, finitely many linear inequality constraints. Okay. So now let's go through this uh, line by line. So here again, W and H are data, right? So they're perfectly known. And I want to be immunized against any realization of Xi in this set. To require that all of my constraints should be satisfied for all Xi in this set is the same as to require that each of my constraints, my uncertain constraints individually, should be satisfied for all Xi. So now I'm going to focus on a single uncertain constraint and I'm going to show that I can express it efficiently, okay? So each constraint, so in particular the ith one, reads like this, right? So this is the ith row of my A matrix, and this is the ith element of my right-hand side vector, okay? I want this to hold for all xi and xi. Remember, this set xi is a polyhedral set, so really I have infinitely many constraints here. Right? So if I look at the ith robust constraint, it corresponds to infinitely many constraints. So it looks like it's a difficult problem, right? Here, in, for the second line, I just replace um, uh, ai of xi and bi of xi by their definitions, right? We said they are affine functions of the uncertain parameters xi. For the third line, I just move everything that relates, that is uncertain, right? That is multiplied by xi to the left, and everything that is a constant for our purposes here that does not depend on xi to the right. Okay? So now we have this guy, which says that for all xi, I want this left-hand side to be smaller than this constant, right? For any given x, this guy on the right is a constant. This is the same, clearly, as saying that if I seek the highest value that this guy can take, when xi takes value in the uncertainty set, that value should be smaller than this constant, right? So the third line is equivalent to this line, where on the left I'm solving a small subproblem, right? I'm saying that if I seek the value of xi that is going to make this objective as high as possible among all the feasible choices that nature or xi can take, this value should be smaller than that constant. Everyone with me up to now? All right, and now this is the key. The key is duality theory. What it says, it says that, well, this maximization problem, this is a linear optimization problem, right? That maximizes over the uncertain parameters xi, right? This problem is equivalent as this dual minimization problem, right? So now I have um, an optimization problem that is a minimization problem whose optimal objective value should be smaller than a constant. But this can be just stated as an existence, as a feasibility problem, right? I am saying that there must exist a lambda that would satisfy the constraints of this problem and whose objective value would be smaller than that constant. All right, so what have we achieved? We started with infinitely many constraints and we express this equivalently as a set of linear equalities and inequalities, right? And in fact, finitely many of them, right? We can do this for each and every one of the constraints in the problem, right? And we obtain an LP. 
What's the size of that LP? Well, the number of decision variables would actually be polynomial in the size of the original problem, meaning the number of decision variables of the original problem, the number of constraints of the original problem, and the number of constraints used to encode the uncertainty set. So this is quite cool, right? And fairly surprising result that, that basically an undergrad could do, right? All right. Time, how much? Minus 10. Minus 10? All right. Okay. So uh, give me two minutes to wrap up then. So, um, so we can extend some of these ideas to sequential decision-making problems um, or approximately extend these ideas. So in sequential decision-making problems, what happens is that the uncertain parameters are revealed sequentially. And in response to the uncertain parameters that we have observed up to a certain point in time, uh, we are going to make decisions. So these, decis these problems are more challenging than single stage problems because our decisions can, uh, are functions of the uncertain parameters, right? We're optimizing over uh, decisions that map realizations of the uncertain parameters to actions. The idea here is to approximate the, the, um, the second stage or recourse decision, so these functional variables, by um, by um, uh, functions uh, that are parametrized by a small number of uncertain parameters. So uh, by, sorry, by a small number of decisions. So in particular, we can restrict these general decisions, so these general mappings, uh, to be linear in the, the uh, uncertain parameters that we have observed up until a particular period. So then what happens is that we no longer have functional decision variables. We're optimizing over the coefficients of these decisions. This enables us to cast our multi-stage problem as a, a single-stage uh, problem and just apply the techniques that I showed you exactly in the same way uh, to solve that problem efficiently. Of course, we've introduced an approximation, um, but that approximation oftentimes is uh, benign. For example, uh, we use these uh, ideas in the context of this airport problem I began with, uh, where we decide how to uh, screen uh, uh, passengers as they go through the um, uh, checkpoints. Um, what we showed is that, first of all, we can uh, solve uh, these uh, problems uh, where the um, arrival times of the passengers are uncertain very efficiently using these techniques, and also um, that they perform a lot better than techniques that ignore uncertainty in the arrival um, and that m in the arrivals, and that must rely on heuristic for um, allocate on heuristics for allocating any passengers that um, would overflow, meaning. Should we assign, if we assign, if more passengers than planned arrived, we don't know what to do with them in a plan that ignores uncertainty, right? And so you must decide on the spot what to do with these guys. And so one idea would be, well, just assign them to a random team or just assign them to a team that is the most effective and so on and so forth. So we compared our approach that explicitly accounts for uncertainty in the arrivals to um, these heuristic approaches. We perform far better. Basically, in the worst case, we um, outperform all of these approaches by over 75% uh, in terms of our objective value. Uh, and even in the average case, where one would think that, oh, robust optimization is conservative, you know, well, actually, uh, we outperform these approaches even in this case. So um, that was very nice. These are the references I used for my talk. And thank you so much. And I hope I, hope I achieved some of my objectives for the talk. Um, yeah, I don't have time for questions, I imagine. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Okay, fair enough. All right, thank you.